Truth Driven Thinking number 85, Free Will and Naturalism with Tom Clark. Welcome back to Truth Driven Thinking, where we don't claim any special insight into absolute truth or make any claims about having found truth. The point is that we're looking for it and trying to identify the best tools for finding it and seek guidance along that that path. In fact, this is quite related to our guest today, who's going to be Tom Clark from the Center for Naturalism, which can be found online at naturalism.org. Now, before we bring Tom on, I should point out that there's really no coincidence that Mr. Clark is our first official guest for the relaunched all-new Truth Driven Thinking podcast. Um, As I get ready to wrap up just under 11 years as a school board trustee and president of my small uh, school board here in Michigan, I was thinking back to the things that I've learned about education over that time. And um, certainly, I am not an education expert. I'm not an education professional. Um, once again, my understanding though, of the world was found to be through this experience quite lacking. Um, about every piece of research I've seen about public education during this time has told me that there are people in our culture and certain subgroups whose kids start behind, start school behind in about every way we could measure. Um, that they haven't had the support at home, they haven't had books, educated parents, uh, the other essential ingredients for success. And, and try though we may, and we will never give up, nor should we, a lot of this debate on education, um, everything I've seen, virtually everything I've seen, says socioeconomic status is the biggest indicator of who will achieve. And that it's really difficult to get outside that. So uh, yes, uh, yeah, here I was raised from this kind of rugged individualistic bootstraps background, and we struggled with that here on the program a little bit publicly. And here I saw that it was easy for me to discount these kids and say that they're making bad choices. You know what? Somehow, after 11 years, I see it's not nearly that simple. So same way kind of as I try to understand the complex reality about the debates over markets and capitalism and regulation in the wake of the fiscal crisis. So big questions, you know, how much class mobility do we really have and what are the, do we live in this meritocracy and, and merit-based world that we think? So one, one other full disclosure uh, along my skeptical journey, uh, which again, many people here know is, has been taking me to kind of this post-Christian, uh, post and Randian uh, now, uh, I admit to being a little bit in the tank here for naturalism and for what Mr. Clark's going to talk about, uh, even a deterministic worldview. But lest I get into this stuff um, uh, about which I probably shouldn't even be commenting, be- well, let's talk to somebody who does know this stuff. Tom studied in philosophy at Tufts University, where some guy named Daniel Dennett was his advisor back then. Um, He is a research associate at the Institute for Behavioral Health at the Heller School of Brandeis University. And of course, we know Tom Clark as the founder and director of the Center for Naturalism, which is conducting public education, policy development, and community building to promote worldview naturalism. Tom is also the author of Encountering Naturalism, A Worldview and Its Uses. And with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to the program, Mr. Tom Clark. Welcome, Tom. Well, Steve, uh, it's it's great to be here. I'm I'm privileged, I must say, to be your your first guest in the uh, reincarnation of your show. And congratulations on getting back online. It's terrific. Well, thank you, and the the pleasure and honor truly is ours. Um, there's so many directions I know that we can go with this conversation, and um, and I've thrown out some questions. I'm sure I won't even get to any of them because we'll just have so much fun. Um, but one of my goals for the program is to kind of break things down so that uh, who I was seven years ago might even be able to understand what we're talking about here. <laughs> you know, the first times people started throwing out terms like determinism and naturalism, and um, it can be confusing. So how about if we just start with a little bit of an explanation from you as to what naturalism is? 
Sure. Well, in its most simple form, uh, the worldview of, of naturalism is, is the idea, kind of a philosophy of life or a, a, a sort of metaphysical stance, kind of a combination of both. But the basic idea is that nature is what there is, and nature is enough for us as human beings living our lives. So uh, we, we get to naturalism. Um, by root of being empiricists about how we know what we know, that is basically being scientists, um, being from Missouri, which is the show me state, okay? Mm-hmm. And what science shows to be the case is that the, what exists is nature, the natural world, and we're completely included in the natural world as human beings. So by naturalism is simply, uh, what I mean is, is coming to terms with the fact that there's nothing beyond nature, there's no supernatural realm, and then also seeing how this view can uh, impact our lives, how, what it means for us, practically speaking, ethically speaking, and existentially speaking. All right, and, and that's probably a good place to, to clarify this question of supernatural versus natural. Um, I've heard the natural world described as all that, all that has been ever known to humanity. In other words, everything we know about everything uh, is within the natural realm that which is unknown. Is that a fair starting point? Well, again, it depends on how you do, uh, decide how you know what you know. Um, if you're an empiricist, you stick with public evidence uh, that, say, science uses and other empirical disciplines use to decide what, what the case is about the world. And if you do that, what you find is there are physical objects, um, basically the, the panoply of... of entities and, and processes and, and phenomena that science finds, and human beings are all part of that. So that's, that's nature is what science discovers to exist thus far. We've got no reason to suppose that there's something beyond nature, no good evidence from an empirical standpoint, that there's something beyond or, or apart from nature that constitutes a separate supernatural realm. Although, of course, most people believe in such a realm, and that's where naturalism comes in and says, no, no good evidence for the supernatural. So there's a in defining nature, we're actually making a contrast statement between nature and something that's conceivably other than nature. And what that could be, what the supernatural could be, is an interesting question. And whether the supernatural could actually exist in some form or not is an interesting question. I, I myself take the position that we can't know in advance that the supernatural doesn't exist. So that in claiming that not, nature is all there is, it's actually an empirical claim based on our best way of knowing. So that's, this means naturalists are not dogmatic about saying that the supernatural doesn't exist or could never exist. I, we just may, we, we say, or at least I say, and would recommend saying that in deciding what's true about the world, all the evidence points that what there is is a single realm of interconnected phenomena that we call nature, and there's no good evidence for something besides that that we'd want to call the supernatural, whether it's a, say, a god or a a soul or or an immaterial mental essence or something like that. Okay, so so when I kind of was parroting this conventional thing, I've heard people say every encyclopedia, everything we've discovered about the natural world, all of the entirety of human knowledge, that's the natural world. That really evidences, though, a little bit of a bias, right? Because there is a dispute about what is human knowledge. Um, some have experiences say experiences of god that um they all fill an arena uh get together and worship and and claim to have knowledge that i don't so am i not being biased at the very outset of my question there well you're yeah i mean you're taking a a side in the dispute about what constitutes knowledge and it's fine to take sides as long as you can you know back up your uh decision about what side you're on. And I, I think the naturalist has, is, can make a good argument why we should be empiricists. But you're right, there is a dispute about what, what does count as knowledge. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, how do we decide that question? And so, uh, as I put it, we have to put epistemology first when we, it comes to a worldview. Uh, how do we know what we know? And how do we justify our view about that? So, that, that's where it begins. <clears throat> How do you know what's real? Uh, and are there good grounds for supposing that your own experience, untethered to public evidence, is good grounds for any knowledge claims? And I would say it isn't. There's no good. Uh, we shouldn't take our own private subjective experience 
as good grounds for believing oh, uh, what's, about what's true, you always need publicly available evidence to back up your knowledge claims. And I think it's, it's rational uh, to be an empiricist in this sense, and it's irrational to suppose that your own subjective or experience or traditional uh, givens from, say, a religious background or your, in, your intuitions um, should be thought as anything like a reliable basis for what you claim is true. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I mean, that makes a ton of sense. There's no way that uh, just because someone believes or feels or experiences something, we've all been there where where that's okay. So God told you to um, rob the bank tomorrow morning. Uh, how do you know always becomes the question. That may be true, but how do we know? So to, to your point, I'm obviously in the tank uh, uh, on your side of that argument. Um, though it is difficult to ig- ignore, it, it almost seems we're evolved to have these anecdotal experiences. We, we trust our anecdotes and our experiences um, heavily, do we not? We do, and this is a big problem. <laughs> it's something that we have to learn to do better <clears throat> and not trust ourselves. Because that's the whole point of science is that you don't trust your intuitions. You look for uh, confirmation of what you hope hope or believe or or suspect might be the truth about the world. You look for confirmation coming from outside your experience, confirmation coming from things that other people can see and touch and observe. And it may seem obvious to the two of us, but it isn't obvious to many people that this is how you should be, uh, be a knower in the world. Lots of people do trust their intuitions implicitly. They say, I feel that God has spoken to me. I've had the experience of being abducted by aliens. Sure. You can't prove I'm wrong. Sure. And, <laughs> but of course, the two of us would say, well, how, how, can you, how do you know that that experience was ver- veridical? Sure. How do you know it represented reality accurately? Or I took this pill and my cold went away. Therefore, the pill works. I know it works. I've done it three times. Right. Again, <clears throat> correlation not being causation, we'd have to investigate further. Was it your belief in the pill? Or the pill itself, talking about the placebo effect. Or coincidence. <laughs> yeah, or, or coincidence. Very good, yeah. Three, three times. Um, before we leave kind of this topic of um, how can we know, there was a recent Facebook discussion. A friend wrote a very thoughtful article uh, that she shared, and there was good discussion. She thinks she can say there is no God. Um, while certainly I've spent uh, years in anguish and in, in, uh, we've had Bishop Spong and Dr. Robert Price and, and many great thinkers on this show, and that process has led me to uh, as little doubt as I could imagine having that, that a personal God does not exist. Nonetheless, I had some trouble taking that step, and I, so I want to explore this just a little further. Some have said that Dawkins... Um, or Sam Harris, have tipped over into a philosophical arena that gets outside of the domain of science when they say uh, God cannot exist. And I'm putting words in in their mouth now. They probably haven't said that per se. But can you enlighten us a little on this debate? Uh, Is that scientism? Right. Well, uh, just just to set the record straight, Dawkins has said that on a scale of one to eight or something like right, that. He's a seven, oh, yeah. right? So he is not being absolutely fundamentalist, dogma- dog- dogmatic about this at, at all. He He's taking, I think, an empirical stance the way I do, saying that there's, since there's no good evidence at all that God exists, we're rational to believe that he doesn't exist. I agree. I would only interject. I've read a couple of, you know, and, and you can pick apart any, any book, but uh, there are some citations. I don't have them in front of me from his book that argue he's tipped over into philosophy, into a kind of scientism. Well, when you say scientism, scientism is the idea, at least uh, according to the dictionary, that science is the only way to know what we know. <clears throat> there are no other facts besides scientific facts. Uh, and, uh, you know, taken literally, that's that's probably not the case because there are other, there are other modes of knowing, <clears throat> excuse me, for instance, knowing how to do things. There are, there are aesthetic and uh, ethical traditions that aren't directly tied to science. 
So not all propositions are, uh, that we'd want to say are true probably are, are necessarily scientific or empirical propositions. Science isn't the be-all and end-all of human knowledge and know-how. But I would say that when it comes to deciding what's real about the world outside our heads, <clears throat> that we're, we're justified in sticking with empiricism as the basis for, for knowing what we know. And that isn't scientistic. It's simply being uh, saying that science really doesn't have any rivals as far as deciding what is the case about the world, the public world, the, the, the objective world. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I wouldn't accuse Dawkins or any good naturalist uh, um, of being scientific, although that's an uh, accusation that's that's often leveled at, sure, at us. Sure. Sure. Um, well, let's tip this then a little further. One of the real issues that I'd like to explore with you is this issue uh, from a naturalistic worldview that um, because there aren't things that happen outside of our bodies or our brains, that free will is a challenge for naturalism um, in a certain type of free will that, that is called contra-causal free will. You want to elaborate a little bit for us um, about what, what your view is on this? Sure. Uh, in, in speaking about free will, it's important to be clear about what we're talking about. And uh, you said contra-causal free will, which is uh, the way I like to say it because it, it points to a type of free will which supposes that human beings can transcend causation or sort of float above cause and effect when they make their choices. Uh, it's often called libertarian free will by philosophers. So if people want to uh, look up libertarian free will, say, in Wikipedia or the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, that's, that's what I'm refer, referring to by contra-causal free will because I think it's sort of a, a more accurate descriptor of, of the kind of freedom that I'm denying we have. If you're a naturalist, uh, what you notice about the world, of course, is that it it's, has regularities and laws, natural laws, at many different levels. And it's very likely, it seems to me, that human beings are not exceptions to those laws, whether we're talking about biology, physics, chemistry, psychology, and uh, behavior. There are law-like relations which we observe at, at every level of being a human being, and they apply to us, and there's no reason we suppo to suppose that human beings have the freedom to not be at the effect of these laws. So for all practical, practical purpose, purposes, I think we can take a deterministic view of ourselves and suppose that Human behavior, like everything else that we see, pretty much arises as a result of cause and effect regularities coming out of the world. So we don't have a kind of freedom that would allow us, for instance, to have done other than what we did in a given situation. So that sounds like a fairly radical claim, and I think from a common sense standpoint it is, but it's actually the standard sort of view in the philosophical scientific community that we, we don't have any, we're not exceptions to cause and effect uh, in our behavior, in our choices, in our thinking. So this means that as you and I started this conversation, if, if you set all the factors the same at the moment that we started, this is the thought of the experiment, of course, sure. you can't actually do this. Sure. But we would be saying the same words right now. Right. So... Uh, but it doesn't mean, of course, that, we, that we'll do the same thing necessarily in the future when things are slightly different or quite different. So, so this, go ahead. Sorry, just to, to kind of do a check to make sure that, that I've got this. Apart from, and, and we're talking about, uh, I know you would say that we have freedom in the sense that uh, when we're not coerced, we're not in jail, we're not under duress, in the sense that we have general freedom, we still nonetheless... Uh, are the consequence of a complex interaction of everything from our biology, our endocrine system, the environment, every experience we've ever had in life, um, that in essence molecules and atoms interacting uh, mean that there is nothing we can, nothing we can do or think or say that is not fully caused by natural events. Right. Yes, I think that's a fair description. And, uh, of course, there, there may be some kind of quantum 
or micro level randomness yeah. of, of operating in the world. But that kind of randomness wouldn't give us any kind of free will worth wanting, as Daniel Dennett would put it, because a, a, a random factor couldn't be ascribed to you uh, in, in how you make up your mind. It would sim- simply be just that, a random factor uh, inserting itself into the cause and effect processes of how you make your choices. And so it's not something you could take credit for. Forgive me, is this an either-or proposition? Does it either need to be that we live in a deterministic world or a random one? No, I, I think it's very likely true that the determinism isn't the case, that there are perhaps random factors, uh, at, the, at least at the quantum level, okay. that might, and we don't know, might be percolating up and helping to influence our behavior. So it isn't either or. I think there's probably, for all practical purposes, determinism at the macro level. In other words, we, if we knew a situation in sufficient detail, we could predict the outcome fairly uh, fairly well. But of course, at the micro level, there are inherently probabilistic factors that prevent that kind of okay. prediction. And, and when you say the macro level, um, I mean, realistically, the world's most amazing supercomputer times a billion still might not be able to... I mean, we're talking about very complex interactions, right? I, I, I mean... Forget the quantum micro level for a minute. Even at the macro level, to compute every event and cause and effect atomic interaction that led me to this point in my life to have this conversation with you is mind-bogglingly complicated. Yeah, sure. That That's why we needn't worry about being determined creatures at the macro level in terms of being predictable. No one uh, is in a position to predict what we're going to do. But when we Uh, talk about random events, when you talk about random events, you're not talking about uh, the day that the third grader tripped me and made me angry. Um, You're talking about quantum randomness. Right. It's, It's the difference between randomness as a sort of inherent feature of the physical world, which seems to be the case uh, at least according to some quantum theories, as far as I know. Uh, and then the kind of randomness that is we might call random because we don't know enough to have foreseen it, so, even though it might be completely determined. So take me back to my little example as I'm kind of being reflective and retiring from a board of education. When I look at all the indicators of success in socioeconomic status in education, and see that those barriers are so difficult to overcome in even private education. Um, I, are we suggesting then that two children born genetically identical, one uh, in a cause and effect uh, world that winds up impoverished in an inner city with uh, no books within uh, three blocks of the home and uh, a drug addicted parent or whatever, you know, fictitious story we want to create. Um, that, that there is no way that that child could just think their way magically out of the cause and effect chain of events that are going to lead them to uh, a pretty rough life. That's right. There's, there's no magic that, uh, transcendent, uh, capability in any of us, including that child. But um, real, if I may just, because I've, I've had this conversation over an adult beverage or two, and people just freak out at this and say, you know what? I know a kid who came from that environment, who, who transcended that, who, who did. It was amazing. There's no reason that kid should have escaped his poverty, but he did. And if these kids, you know, could just try harder or uh, they might be able to do it. Right. I, I, I think I'm, I'm looking for a good name for that fallacy. I, you might call it the fallacy of equivalent circumstances. And you're right. That's what people often say that, hey, I know a kid that had, you know, grew up in those conditions and, and was able to find her way out. So why couldn't the other one do it? And of course, you have to answer that question. Why didn't the other kid not make it out of those circumstances? Well, the reason they didn't is because they were under the actual circumstances, precise circumstances they were in caused them not to escape their neighborhood. And, and get out of those that situation. So you have to look at the always look at the causal story. That's the only way we can explain why some kids make it and some don't. So the the fact that one kid makes it and the other doesn't isn't an argument for free will. It's an argument for looking very carefully at the causal situation so that we can make it more likely that all kids 
can escape those circumstances. And determinism doesn't mean that things don't and can't change. They change all the time. What determinism means is that we, are, are, we look very carefully at, at the situation that we're in and that other people are in so that we can get better control and with, with luck and hard work uh, do a better job of creating circumstances in which people succeed and flourish instead of get held back. Now, a lot of people will say at that juncture in the conversation that since we're all fully caused, I can't do anything about this anyway, or whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I, why try to save the kids if it's a determined world? Um, how do you counteract that argument or that question? Well, yeah, yeah, that, that you're right. It's, it's sort of the invitation to passivity and fatalism that seems to follow from right. determinism, and that, that's a false inference. We don't know what the future holds. The future holds something, but we don't know what it is. Therefore, what do we do? We have to and will act on our own behalf and on behalf of other people, uh, doing the best we can to bring about the future that we want. Now, this is an all, all a causal process, but the fact is that if you suppose that because things are caused, therefore you don't need to do anything, that's simply a, a non sequitur. And it brings up, a, 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 I think, a very important point about all this, which is when people think about cause and effect uh, and the fact that they're fully caused, they start to somehow and wrongly suppose that they stop existing as a causal factor themselves. <laughs> right. This is, exactly. the, this is the fatalistic um, false inference. You as an agent, me as an agent, we're still, we're still there. We still have our causal powers to make things happen in the world. And we still have the, you know, the ability to put those powers into use. Right. If we're, so, not under, if we're not under duress or we're not somehow constrained in that ability, we still get to play a role in this play. Absolutely. We're just, we, 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 right. We are just as real as all the causal factors that created us. You look at the genetics and the environment that determined who you are. They're all very real, powerful factors. But Steve Gibson is just as real as any of those factors, too. And you're in the thick of it. You're playing your role, too, in how events unfold. And in a way, you don't really have a choice about being proactive on your own behalf. <laughs> when you get hungry, you're going to eat, right? <laughs> and in fact, I've met very few committed fatalists Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Although, I tell you, fatalism uh, can have a deleterious effect on, on one's chances of survival. If you get in a car and say, well, whatever happens is, uh, you know, God's will or up to fate. Absolutely. You I might know drive like a little that. more. <laughs> you might drive carelessly. So, d d the belief that your actions don't have an effect on how events unfold is not a good belief to have. It's false and it's dangerous. In fact, I had a chapter in my novel uh, uh, that was based loosely, I have to be careful here, but on an experience. I was a pilot and with a fatalistic pilot, and it, <laughs> it was a frightening experience. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. It truly was. It was religiously <laughs> fatalistic. Um, and it darn near, quite honestly, could have killed me, but yeah, yeah. You don't don't. But we don't want to let determinism um, uh, lead to to false conclusions about disempowerment. Uh, I've got a lot uh, at naturalism.org uh, about this very point. Uh, one article called "Don't Forget About Me: <laughs> Avoiding How Did it, How Did It Go? Avoiding uh, Demoralization by Determinism." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this you don't is, want to get demoralized. It, so important note there, and and obviously as I've pondered this, this is something that that uh, I obviously agree with you on, which is we are agents in in this process. It is not some uh, nihilistic uh, view of the world. Uh, in fact, you actually argue that. Um, tell me a little bit more about how you see the upside of a naturalistic worldview in terms of, let's face it, we all want to know what it means to me in terms of enjoyment and seeing beauty in life. And tell me why naturalism and even a uh, fully caused world is a good thing for me. Well, we have a little tagline at the Center for Naturalism, which is connection, compassion, and control. 
And we've been talking about connection, which is the causal connection human beings all have to the situations that they're in, both historically and in, their pr- in the present moment. The sort of deterministic view, cause and effect view of how behavior arises. That connects us to the world. The conclusions that I think are positive coming out of this, what I think is a true view of ourselves, is 